This morning, I want to talk about heart truth, and we'll start in a well-known story about two mothers and a young king, 1 Kings 3. And it reads, Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, Pardon me, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. And the other woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. The king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead, while that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He then gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my lord. Give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither I, not, neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Kind of an unusual story, isn't it? Starting off with two prostitutes in the court of the king arguing. You wouldn't really imagine that before King Charles. What would you get up today, honey? Oh, just some prostitutes come visiting and had an argument. You just wouldn't imagine that would be happening. But then this unusual story unfolds and a ruling that just seemed extreme. To be clear, the king wasn't necessarily intending to kill the baby. But he was a new king, and as any mother here would agree, the true mother of the baby wouldn't dare take any chances with her baby. If the king said he was going to have your baby cut in two, you'll do anything to save that baby, even if it meant losing the right to raise it. Here, though, I believe the new king, or sorry, the king knew there was something going on with the second woman and was wisely creating a scenario that would draw out the truth so the child could be returned to his true mother. The king wanted the truth and he wanted justice and the sword was the tool that made the difference. But here's the first thing I want to draw out from the short drama. What was going on inside of the second woman that the king so wisely discerned? When the king said, bring a sword, cut the baby in two. Ladies, what is the correct response for any mother, any woman, mother or not? Surely it's, don't kill the baby. This is crazy. Don't kill the baby. Even if it's not your baby, surely you would all say with urgency, don't kill the baby. But what did the second woman say? Neither I nor you shall have him cut him in two. Lady, what were you thinking? And that is the topic and point of today's message. At the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. This story of the king and the two women is an extreme example of where someone's thinking is clearly messed up, it's deranged, it's gone wrong. 
and points to a far more serious issue of the heart. Remember, the woman actually wanted the child. She stole the child, kidnapped the child. But she was in shock and grief. And there was, of course, a backstory. A prostitute would be at the bottom of the cultural ladder in society at that time. Your identity, your position in society, your home, your honor, your assets, your security, your provision was actually all dependent upon the man and his family that you married into. But was she married? No. She was a prostitute. There was another prostitute. They had no husbands. They had none of that. Unloved, unwanted, and used for cheap by any man who had some spare cash. She is living with another prostitute, and they are both heavily pregnant, alone and without health care, without finance, without honor. There was no benefits there. But this woman has a baby on the way, something to call her own, someone whom she could love, who would love her back. The woman finally had hope, hope for love and a relationship to belong to. And then the best news of all happened. The woman gave birth to a son. Why was that the best news? Because the son in time could earn money and own land and hopefully it would take care of her. Whereas in that culture at the time, like most cultures then, if the woman had a daughter, she would find it very difficult to get any paid work or ever have their own land to provide for themselves. The likelihood, if she had a daughter, would probably mean that the daughter would eventually become a prostitute like her mother to survive. Born of a prostitute, no father to look after her, is probably the likely track that's going to be her life. But good news, the woman had a son, and hopefully this could break that cycle, change that legacy. And her friend had a son. There was hope in their house, even though the future was still going to be difficult. So what happened in this woman's heart when her son died because she accidentally smothered him in the night? What happened to her hopes for the future? What happened to the great joy and love she felt holding her newborn child? And now, what would it be like to live with her friend, her friend who would now every day enjoy every cuddle, every smile, every hope of a better future? What was growing and insurmountable in her desperate heart as she lay there in the middle of the night with the lifeless body of her beautiful only child? Woman, what were you thinking? What was she thinking? What was she feeling? What was she needing? What was she afraid of? And that king discerned something was going on inside this woman as he watched her argue with the baby's real mother. I imagine that the real mother was distraught, panicking, overwhelmed at the thought that this woman might get away with keeping her child. Imagine the injustice. Imagine the sense of betrayal, the fear, the anxiety that she must have felt and how that would come out as she argued in desperation before the king. But then the second woman, the woman in grief, maybe in envy or bitter hopelessness, what would she have been like when she argued the lie that the living baby was hers? You see, we just read it in 2D that they were both arguing and saying the same argument, but when you're watching and listening, you're going to see and hear more than just what's written on the page, correct? What did the king pick up on? I think the king could already tell which one was the real mother. In which mother was reacting out of a life of hopeless despair and now tragic loss and bitter envy? And the sword was the tool that revealed not just the truth about who the child belonged to, but also the truth of the second woman's heart. That's what the sword revealed. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought it 
a sword for the king. He then gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of what? Love for her son. It was her son. She loved him and she said to the king, please, Lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. So it wasn't really about the baby, was it? If it was her baby and she really loved him, how could she say cut him in two? This wasn't about the baby. She said, neither I nor you. Oh, this is about the two ladies. Or at least one of them. It's a heart matter, isn't it? If she couldn't have the baby, she didn't want the other woman to have the baby either. And this woman's heart was such a brokenness and bitterness that she would prefer that the baby was actually dead rather than the other woman had the baby and she be alone again in a state of loss and grief. Remember, these two women living together, I take it they're friends. But something deep down has gone bitterly wrong. I wonder if what she was really feeling was that now she would be at the absolute bottom of society. Because if the other woman was allowed to keep the baby, she would no longer just be a prostitute, she would be a mother. But the woman whose baby had just died wouldn't be a mother, she would just continue only being that prostitute without the friend. Now she was truly alone. Could it be that this woman was driven not just by grief, but by envy and fear? Who knows what she was thinking when she said, cut him in two. She may not have really known what was going on inside her head, the thinking so scattered. But her response didn't come out of rational thought. It didn't come out of a reasonable process of thinking this through. I'm just going to think this through. And you know what? Actually, she's probably quite good at the baby who's dead. That's not rational thinking. That makes no sense. She wanted the boy. That's why she took him. And yet what flows out? Something deeper, way down. You know, this is the same for all of us, although I kind of doubt anybody would be quite in that situation. Uh, but all of us have a background. All of us have a story. All of us have types of trauma, disappointment, grief, rejection, betrayals. They're all in there. You can't be born in this world and come out unscathed. True? But what do we do with it? What's going on in our hearts? What impact does it have? How often do we react to situations, we say things, or we avoid things, we defend things, we attack things, we run from things, we might manipulate others, we might get angry, protest, not because we think it's the wise or right thing to do, or that it honors God, but because there's another part of us that is so powerful, it affects our thinking and our actions. It's a matter of... It's a matter of the heart, not just a mind matter. Jesus said in Matthew 12, for out of the abundance of the heart, another translation says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. How does that fit the story where the woman said, neither I nor you shall have him, cut him in two? What's coming out of her mouth? Well, there's something much deeper, isn't it? It's actually coming from what's stored up in the heart. She was speaking from a much deeper place. And it wasn't just a conscious consideration of the mind. Your mind can't think like that in independence because if you're consciously thinking this situation through, you would surely not ever think of killing the baby. 
To think differently reveals something far more broken in the heart that's making a decision that doesn't make sense in the mind, but it's flowing out of the heart. Out of what fills our hearts, our mouths speak. Our lives only bring forth that which is in our hearts, not our minds. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows out of it. What you do, the actions of life, flow out of the heart. A person may think their own ways are right, thinking in the mind. Yeah, I can justify this. Yeah, this is okay. But the Lord weighs the heart. Why does God weigh the heart instead of the mind, the thoughts, the opinions? Surely you say, well, God really thinks about what you're thinking. He's really thinking about your opinions. He's really judging what you said. And No, he's actually looking at the heart. Why? Because the heart is the source of your desires, your emotions, and will. And that's what flows into the head, the mind, and flows out through the action. The mind is like your body. Your body is simply a tool for outworking what your mind tells it to do. Hmm, I want a cup of coffee. Body, cup of coffee time. All the neurons flash up there and this whole command center in the brain tells your body what to do. The body goes and gets you a cup of coffee comes from the mind. The mind tells the body, the body does it. So also with the mind. It's simply a tool for outworking what's in your heart, what your heart desires, its will, its feelings. So to God, what matters most about you is what is in the heart. That's even more important than what you do with your body, the actions of your life. Why? Because your actions Your inactions, your conduct, and your focus flow from your heart. If your heart is in good order, good things flow out of it through your conduct and speech. So if you can get your heart right, everything else will come out right. But if you can't get that heart right, if it's stuck and busted, then what comes out of it is all messy. And often we judge people by the actions and what they say, but really God's looking at the heart. What's going on there? That's the real truth that we live out of. This concept is so important for us. You already believe it. If I spilt your cup of tea this morning, or your cereal, or your bottle of water, you would likely forgive me straight away. I'm hoping. Is that true in this place? I spilt your cup. I just made that. You get over it pretty quickly, I hope. But if you found out that I spilled it on purpose, then how would you feel? It's the, same, it's the same action. It's the same thing that happened. It's the same consequence. The drink is now on the floor. Sure, you just get over it, correct? Or maybe you'd say, Nigel, what were you thinking? Why? Please help me understand. Please explain this to me. Why would you purposely knock over my drink? Now the heart's getting involved. Now maybe there's an attitude growing. Maybe there's a judgment forming. Your mind is curious, but it's really your heart that wants to know. Is there something going on between us here we need to talk about? What matters most in that situation, the action or the heart? Accident. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. Please let me clean it up. I'll give you another drink. Uh uh-uh. uh. I did that on purpose. The action isn't so important. It's the heart, isn't it? What's in our heart is most important to God because everything flows out of it. And that is what I want you to invite God into in the weeks and years and life ahead. I want us to think about this a bit more. We often think in the surface of our mind. We often judge by the surface of the actions, whereas God's looking at the heart. What's in your heart, and do you know it? God wants to entrust in this church his lost, his broken, his wayward sons and daughters. He wants this church to be a place of healing, deliverance, transformation, discipleship. Isaiah 61, you've heard about it. But what fills up our hearts, what is overflowing from our hearts, 
Is it grace, love, mercy, kindness, patience, wisdom, faith? Do I have a heart that is filled with God's heart for people, or is it filled up on other things? Church, we're in a time of preparation, a time of getting ready for harvest. We're building out these facilities because we believe God has many people he wants to bring home to his house, not just this church, but other churches too. He's bringing home his lost ones to be healed, to be transformed, to be discipled for mission. But we don't have an organization that can do it. There's no program for that. That is a relational process that happens as God's heart and spirit flows through us. And that can't happen if our hearts are filled up on other pursuits, other desires, other hurts, other needs or idols, or if our heart is locked down by walls of fear, of pride, of grief, or unforgiveness. Is my heart filled up with God's heart, his love, his peace, his grace? Am I walking in step with his spirit, being led by him, obedient to his will? See, that's all, that's a, discipleship is a reproductive process. We only reproduce what we are. A few weeks ago, I was teaching on your identity as rulers in God's kingdom. You are created to rule. This life is where we are trained with the situations of earth to be good stewards and rulers so we are made ready for the glory and eternal kingdom God wants to entrust to us in the age to come. The earth is all about preparing you to rule and reign in the age to come. And that's what we saw so vividly in the life of Joseph. Being a slave in Potiphar's house and then betrayed again into prison, Joseph's heart was tested and trained. Instead of becoming bitter, broken, locked down, he served generously and was a blessing even to his slave master, a blessing even to the prison warden. His bitter situation was the opportunity for his blessed service. Is that how I would see it? Or I just see the bitter situation? And take the opportunity to complain, to protest, to get angry at God, to mistreat others. He saw it as an opportunity to bless, to serve. That's what was in his heart. That's what flowed out. God was doing that work in him. As a result, God could trust him with the power and authority that Joseph had dreamed of when he was only 17 years old. In one day, he was promoted from prisoner to prime minister. And by his qualified and wise stewardship, he saved the lives of much of the world at that time. I love that story. Because it wasn't just a supernatural thing. Obviously, there's the supernatural grace and blessing of God upon Joseph and the supernatural dreams. But then he had to steward resources for 14 years, seven years of plenty. He actually devised a system for collecting up all the seed and working with people on that, storing that up, so that when seven years of famine came, they had, a, had the seed available and had a process for it. He'd learned stewardship where? In slavery and in prison. You wouldn't have put that down in an NZQA course, would you? I want to be a great steward for the government and help save lives. Well, we're going to send you to slavery first and then to prison. You just got to trust God, don't you? Now listen to the testing and preparation Joseph's descendants faced centuries later. Moses says to the nation of Israel at the end of 40 years wandering in the wilderness, he said, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. So Israel, 
Stick to God's commands. Obey them. Revere God. Church, is that the right thing to do? Of course you hardly need to say that, do you? But notice the bigger purpose. They are about to be entrusted with some of the most prosperous and desired land on the planet, called the promised land. This is what God had been telling their forefathers for over 400 years. This people group are finally about to become the blessed, prosperous, and glorious kingdom God had always intended for them. This is Moses' last messages. He's about 120 years old. Last messages to the people before he dies. He knows that he's not going into the promised land. He's about to die. Deuteronomy outlines his last messages. It's pretty simple, people. Observe his commands. Walk in obedience to him. Revere him. Tick. Got it. We're all good. Church, God is always planning on entrusting you with more. That's the nature of his kingdom and his heart for you. That's what it means to be a son, a daughter, a child of God. He wants to entrust his kingdom to you. He always wants to entrust you with more. But this generation of Abraham and Joseph's descendants, were they ready for that? Would they steward it appropriately? Would they continue to worship God and above all, obey him, being faithful to his commands? Listen to what Moses says next to God's people just before they enter into this promised land. He said, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, by the way, because that's God's heart for his people. That was his plans. That's what he was leading them into. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, brain ticking here, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. This is the way he confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Church, how relevant is that warning to us today? When we eat and are satisfied, I wonder if anybody here has eaten and been satisfied this week. Maybe that's just your norm every day. Oh, you sound very blessed. When we're accommodated, when we have money coming in, when we're comfortable, prospering, What then happens in our heart? That's what God's looking at. Do become proud. This is really about me. I I achieved this. Numero uno. Will we forget God and what he's done for us? Oh, Sunday, better head back down to church. What happens the other six days? Will we still Give him genuine praise, adoration, true gratitude when the songs aren't playing. And it's Monday morning, Wednesday night, Saturday afternoon. Woo! Will we pay attention to God's commands, seeking his direction and obeying him? Or will our hearts be filled up with other things. 
Will we pay attention to God's commands, seeking his lead and leading his direction, his will, obeying him? Moses here explains that God led this generation through the dangerous wilderness where there was no water or food, not accidentally, but on purpose. It was a place of testing and preparation where their hearts would be revealed and their will or volition would be prepared. God wants our hearts to be made ready for what he next wants to entrust us with. Remember, Moses said to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. If you're new to the scriptures, uh, there's a lot more to come in this story. As it goes through a number of kings, you can read the books of Kings or the books of Chronicles, and you get to see what actually, how did they go in the promised land. Long story short, not so well. God wants our hearts to be made ready for what he next wants to entrust us to. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Not self, trust in the Lord. You know, that's one of the toughest things in the heart of mankind, to truly trust. We're so familiar with the term and we so want to believe it. But what we're thinking in our head and what's going on in our heart can be quite different. What is it to really trust God from your heart? It does mean surrendering lordship. The desire to be the one that controls for your own will. To say, actually, whatever you want, I will do. You have to trust him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Not my money, not my skills, not what I've achieved, not my ability, but my confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out, so send out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries. Woohoo! In a year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Oh, that's a bit of a change. I wasn't expecting that. Where'd that come from? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Where does the conduct and disease, the deeds come from? The heart. It's the overflow. And yet, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? What an unusual mix and contrast in those statements by Jeremiah. At the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The blessed position it was what comes from living a life trusting God and his will and his ways, not our own. But does our heart trust God and his will and his ways? Do we seek his word, his voice and leading and obey always? The first part of that question is the most important. Do we seek his voice as leading? Oh, I can't hear God. Do you seek his voice and leading? Do we pursue his will, pursue his heart? Say, God, help me to know you. Help me to know your voice. God, I set aside time and space to be still before you, to seek you in your word. I worship you above all things. What's going on in our heart? Does our heart trust God, his will and ways? Do we seek him? Who can know the thoughts and deceptions of his own heart? No one, but God does. And he reveals what's really going on in our hearts through the situations he leads us through. In this land of opportunity, what do we spend our time doing? What is the purpose of our time each day? What is the focus of our time? And what do we do when we're tested with suffering, rejection, or the possibility of looking bad or underperforming, underperforming, or being maybe at fault? 
Is there something in our heart that reacts? Something that fights or defends or hides or avoids or escapes? It's one of my favorite questions, just thinking about that. Because as a pastor, I spend a lot of time with people. Wanting to support them, help them. But the issue is always the heart. And we're not always wanting to know what's in the heart. In fact, sometimes what we say to people comes out of a carefully arranged process in the thinking of the mind that hides the heart on purpose. The problem is we don't really necessarily know that because, well, Jeremiah said the heart's deceitful above all else. Who could fathom it? There's something that has to happen here first. And it's a whole world of trust. Do you want to hear his voice? Do you want to know his leading, his direction, and obey? Or is there something else enthroned in the heart that says, I don't necessarily want to know it all. Unless it lines up with my will, what I want, then I'd love to hear. But if it doesn't, I'm not too sure if I want to know what God wants. The issues of the heart, isn't it? What's really in our hearts? Sometimes we're not aware that there's a fear at work. Sometimes there's a woundedness that's at work, still living, unresolved. And so when God wants to lead us into a new direction or calls us for a sacrifice of our will or brings us into a new realm of rule and entrustment with more influence, what then happens? What then flows out? What then reacts? I want us to be clear about three things today. I need to know the truth about my heart condition. It affects everything I do and what I will be entrusted with. Secondly, I can't know the truth about my heart condition on my own. The heart often fights to hide its truth. Third, I need to ask God to reveal my heart and change it. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. God wants to fulfill his purpose in you, for you. He wants to entrust more to you. But he needs to be the one that prepares you for that. And it's a work he does both in the mind, but most importantly, in the heart. Next week I'll share another part of the story of the two women, and we'll look at the kind of relationship you've been given with God that many Christians don't actually walk in. We have something so precious and powerful yet so often neglected. Next week we'll explore and go deeper into the glory and power of what we have available. But for now, here's a response I would like you to consider, a prayer. It says, Heavenly Father, you are holy, awesome, and good, worthy of all my worship. Help me to trust you with my heart. I give you permission to reveal the true condition of my heart. I ask you to heal me and make me whole. I need you above any other thing or person. Help me to know this truth. Amen. Is that something you'd like to pray? I'd ask that you don't pray that unless you really do want what that prayer is asking. Remember, God is good. Jesus said, Which of you, if your sons ask for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Here's the thing. If you ask God in this prayer for something good, he's never going to give you something bad. That's Jesus' point. I don't know if I can ask. What will he do? If you're asking him for something you need, if you're asking him for something that's good, why would you think he'd give you something bad? If your son asked you for a fish, you wouldn't think of giving him a snake or a scorpion. Why would you think God would give you something bad when you've asked for something good? What does your heart think God is? So have a think about that. 
If you're asking him to reveal what's going on in your heart, to heal and change, correct and empower this heart of yours. Is he going to do something bad? No. He's going to do something good. So the first thing today, God, can I trust your heart? Help me and my heart to trust you. Otherwise, we'll never genuinely seek after God. We'll add him to things. And by his amazing graciousness, He'll walk with you, he'll love you, he'll even bless you. But we'll never live in the fullness that he's made us for. We'll always miss out on the truly abundant life. We'll only pick and choose. And you know what? You'll get second best, but you might think it's amazing. Because you've never known the first best. I'm going to read that prayer out. And if you're ready and want to pray this prayer, then please join me. But if you're not ready, don't pray it. Don't feel guilty about it. Feel free to choose. God still loves you and will continue to knock on the door of your heart. But I want us to be very careful in what we pray, that we come to that place of truth. Even the songs that I love singing, man, they've got some great words. Are they truly the words of my heart? Do I truly mean that? Or that's what we do, we just sing it. It doesn't have to be true to us, we just sing it because it's the words of the song. It's tough, isn't it? But I love that kind of thing because it forces me to, with integrity, think about, hang on, ooh, am I at that place? God, help, help change this. I want to come back to that place. What about you today? Nothing else really matters, my friend. If in your heart there's something that's broken or there's something that's walled up, there's something that's locked down, there's something else enthroned, there's something else that's toxic, there's something else that's proud, there's something else that just says, actually, I don't want to. And remember, we're not trying to change our heart. We're saying, God, I need you to do that. Just take a moment. And then I'm going to pray that prayer up there. And if you so wish, you can join me. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, you are holy, awesome. You are good. Worthy of all my worship. Help me to trust you with my heart. I give you permission to reveal the true condition of my heart, I ask you to heal me and make me whole. I need you above any other thing or person. Help me to know this truth. Amen.